okay, I expected not so many people to participate in my workshop. Basically, I thought about making it something like class style and just um, having people asking questions and also have some very strong feedback loop. But I try to do it anyway, and if it does not work out, I will just maybe um, stop earlier and people who want to explore some more perf features can just come up to me and we can sit somewhere and uh, try out stuff. Um, but for those people who are now um, trying to participate, um, what we need so far is that either you have a recent Linux kernel installed on your system with, which has all the config perf features enabled and also is compiled with debug info support. Um, a lot of, thank you. A lot of distributions actually chip with, with out, of, out of kernel debug information. Um, so for example, if you have Fedora, you can just debug info install kernel and it will download all the packages necessary that you have full debug info um, information on your system. Uh, we will need some more packages. Uh, so we will at some point see PH hole, which is provided by the, by the drafts package in Fedora at least. I guess it's also easy to find that in, in Debian or in other packages. Who of you already knows about PH, uh, PA hole? Who uses that? Okay, not so many. Um, okay, so I guess the, the biggest problem nowadays for, for perf is that at least if I talk to people or show, try to show people what perf can actually do is, is that the debug information is correct. And nowadays it is like um, that the compiler always embeds a specific build ID into the system, uh, into, into the object files. And the object files then can kind of get hashed in this specific path. Uh, can you see the mouse pointer? So it's a sp specific path, user lib debug build ID. And um, oh, you cannot. I just I just switched to mirror mode, sorry. Okay, my television went out. <laughs> um, so ba basically, we have a mm, direct user lib debug. I guess it's the same for, for a lot of distributions today. And in there, we have a, a build ID directory, which basically is kind of a hash for all the debug information we, we have on such a system. And um, so, perf uses that quite a bit to display or let you find specific variables which are used in the source code so you can actually trace specific var variables later on in the in the system. Um, that's basically pretty easy to manage. So in, in Fedora, for example, if you see uh, debug info packages, they basically just install um, all those hash files and later on, all the kernel modules are, are basically also installed which debug with debug information. And the perf utility, or all, mostly all elf utilities, just do a side look up into the, into the um, debug cache and then resolve the debug information. So um, I don't know, there was work also to, to make this, make this a bit less verbose because debug information are quite heavyweight on the system and consume quite a lot of, quite a lot of storage. And so, for example, Solaris has, has smaller, uh, they have a specific um, debug system, debug information-like um, way, which is embedded into the kernel, which they use in, in, in D-Trace. And I don't know what, what Linux will do there in, in future, but um, currently debug info is the way to go. There are also some commands which you can use to actually deal with this. So basically, build ID list and build ID cache. It allows you, if you have, for example, specific programs where uh, it's not you are not able to um, where Perf is not able to manually find the specific debug information, you can basically 
build ID cache dash A and can um, import debug information manually for specific object files. And um, build ID list just gives you a list of what, um, <coughs> sorry. Ah, sorry, you also need to have um, something going on and after that, Perf ID list can show you which build IDs get used um, by your current um, perf data. Um, oh, still visible? So, and there's another directory which is in your home directory, which is just dot debug. So you manually can also link in debug information there, but you normally don't need that. Um, so uh, slides are a bit out of order. Uh, so if you want to, for example, transfer perf data between different systems, so in case you you for example take a perf perf trace on some system and you want to analyze it on some other system, there is this command uh, perf archive, which just um, creates a perf data tar set two file, and it also includes all the debug information which are relevant for you to. Um, inspect the specific perf data file. So that's basically the easiest way to, to move perf data between different different machines. Um, later on I will ask a question if, if someone or people can come up with ideas how to actually do large scale um, perf um, recordings or how one how one can can maybe even do that network transparently, so you can always have something like agents which currently trace performance data, and I don't know if that's possible, but basically that's the way I currently use it. <coughs> okay. Um, I don't know who of you actually has, has ever used perf. Okay, already quite a few people. So I guess some of the commands are, are not new for you, so basically I guess what I started with was perf top which is the command which has a top-like display, but it also allows someone to actually um, see C functions, which are causing most of the cycles currently burned on the CPU. And that was quite kind of cool. And I guess that's what also, that, that was also the reason why I looked more into, into perf. <coughs> so for those people who don't know uh, perf top, it basically just gives gives you a specific top-like view and you can browse around and look at the symbols which currently acquire most of the, of the cycles. So it, the default event which is currently used is, is cycles, which just basically gives you the number of, uh, or just looks at where uh, most of the CPU cycles are burned in which C function. <coughs> Um, most of those com uh, most of those commands actually share most of the command line options, so it's basically pretty easy to um, adapt things. So most of the, those commands use dash, use dash e, for example, to specify an event, and um, so you can always transfer some of the command line options. Um, the next command is perf stat, which is basically pretty easy. It just you can just uh, specify um, a binary or a, a workload to run, and it just gives you an output of, of what basically, uh, it just gives you some numbers you can now expect. So perfstat is also pretty much extensible, so you can specify your own events for um, working with it, and you see a lot of numbers, but we can later see how, how we can actually look into specific numbers or what they actually mean. But it's interesting to just have a first look at uh, maybe what what um, performance problems have, and it's also a pretty pretty accurate time elapsing a uh, time time measuring way to check how long a binary is run. <coughs> so, but most of the time we we in perf we use something like post mortem analysis. So we record or we uh, spend quite some time to try to find um, the correct ways to measure things. And afterwards, we, we start a perf record, run the workload multiple t multiple times or one time, and then afterwards, we, we just have a massive perf data file, and we try to analyze it. And so this perf data file 
is mostly generated by perf record and it ju it's just generated in the um, local directory. Um, and perf record is basically the same like perf stat or like perf top, so it just samples events or counts events and it just creates a file like perf data in your current directory. And further on, um, most of the commands which don't do analyzing or don't do ins directly insert stuff into the kernel work automatically with this perf data file. So you can of course, manually say which perf file you actually want to use, but basically the default is the perf, the perf data. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and there are some other very important commands, which is, for example, the perf list command. Um, Perflist is basically giving you a, a nice overview of, of what um, your current system supports for um, events you can trace. So we do have some hardware events, which are basically caused by, by the hardware itself. Um, those are specific performance monitoring counting reg reg registers, which you can program in a way that, for example, you can specify how much events, uh, you can specify a sample period, so you just write how many events should pass until a specific interrupt is being fired. And when the interrupt is fired, the software can take an, an, a measurement at that moment and can copy that into the perfing buffer, which then gets, used, uh, gets pushed into user space. Um, so they, those ba basically um, are sampling events. You can either specify a frequency which, with which you want to measure them, or you can use um, a sampling period or sampling count, which you want best. Um, I even don't know what, uh, we can later look in how that works. And there are some kind of software events. Software events are basically events which the kernel fires itself without um, you having, or without the hardware doing anything. That's basically for minor faults or major faults or CPU clock cycles, which are pretty much easy to, to just, so basically there's just a function call, or just some, some specific trace point in the, in the kernel which just fire those specific events. Um, we have quite a lot of hardware cache events which help you to look into how the caches are working if you have misses or if you, yeah, if you want to just improve your caching behavior of your current, of your current system. Um, we will look a bit more into that soon. Um, branch loads and branch, branch load misses. And branch instructions um, are kind of new support in, in Perf. Um, I haven't played with them that much until now. It's also bec mostly because I don't use and use CPUs all the time. But it seems very interesting currently. So um, especially a very cool program which uses branch instructions uh, branching instrumentation in Perf is AutoFDO, which is now released by Google, where they actually take Perf captures and convert them to GCC um, profile-driven feedback uh, data. So GCC can automatically, for example, do comp the complete likely and unlikely instrumentation, or the likely and unlikely annotations in the code without um, further, you, uh, further thinking of the programmers. And the funny thing actually is that basically there was a talk on uh, lately that even if you do, don't run the same workload like it was um, optimized or was captured with, uh, it still gives you a huge advantage. So that's kind of interesting for branch instructions. <coughs> Anas, yeah, question? Yeah. Could you repeat that part again? How the hell do you find out where the branches were? Uh, sorry? I just wanted you to repeat the name, that was all. Ah, so it's on, it's on GitHub. Uh, it's called AutoFDO. And support for the feedback. Um, yeah, that's basically the project. Uh, Google slash AutoFDO on, on GitHub. And the, fee uh, the feedback driver for that is included in GCC5. So it will be released about on around uh, April, May, this GCC, and then can be used by everyone. <coughs> Um, yeah, there are also some power management and other events. You have raw events, and then you have the specific trace point events, which are just again um, trace points which are specifically um, 
implemented in the kernel at some point. So there are some macros which allow you to very easily specify trace points and export them to user space, which kind of is also a problem. And you will later see that we don't have a lot of events for the networking part, especially TCP, because it is considered by David to be some kind of user space API, which must be kept stable. And so if we change something in the networking stack, uh, we need to try to have a stable, still a stable trace point. And so it's not, there are not a lot of networking specific trace points nowadays. Um, but maybe we don't need that. Um, so if you if you don't know which 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 event descriptors you're used for generating your record, there's this perf ev list command, which is quite handy. So if you um, have your current perf data somewhere, you can just perf ev list, and if you just specify the both, you can see also the sampling frequency. So we currently sample with 4,000 hertz, and some other specific flex you can see which were automatically used by, by perf record. Uh, if you have questions or if you have comments or if I did something wrong, please just um, talk. Sorry, I... So the question is what? I'll repeat it for you. What was the question? Re repeat the AV listing. I don't know. I'll put it in this way and I'll give you the mic. So um, I, I said that basically perf is, is mostly post-mortem analysis and there is a new tool coming up which, which is perf trace, uh, which I more and more use as a replacement for S trace because S trace is kind of very, very slow. It, it does a user space kernel transition on two times for every syscall. So, um, and perf trace just uses the tracing infrastructure to emulate S trace, which is much more performance, um, which is a big performance improvement because perf trace just writes to the um, ring buffers perf provides and user space can easily extract the data from there and it's not per syscall overhead, but it's like bulking. <laughs> and it, had, it does not yet have the full, the full um, power of S trace, but I guess soon they, they try to actually do that. And if I'm not mistaken, there are already patches out there which allow you to um, also use normal ker kernel trace points as a t at the same time with the syscalls um, you use um, for tracing. So it's, for example, easy to see something like that you want to perf trace a send message syscall and look if something happens in between the where you fired, where you actually um, invoked the syscall and uh, when it returned. Um, basically, it's also very easy to use. So if you just do a perf trace ls, you see it's basically giving you the same information like, like, um, sorry, like S trace and also does help you to actually interpret quite a lot of data. So my thing is that, for example, you don't only see the file descriptor, but you also see um, the resolved path. It does so by, by, I learned that it does so by, by querying proc fs quite often. Um, and as I said, in, in future, there's, there's also the possibility to um, interleave the trace points into that. Um, what's also possible, I haven't put that on my slide, is that basically um, you can at the same time trace, sorry, the mouse is not working that well. Um, you can also trace page faults with perf, so if you want to try that, it should be possible. <coughs> I have not yet used that feature and I've seen it just one week ago. 
we can have a look if it generated something. No, I don't think so. <coughs> but maybe it will work soon. So that's currently work in progress. <coughs> Yeah. So after you have under, after you have basically um, recorded all your data, there's there are multiple ways to to actually analyze the data. Um, there's most of people, I guess, use Perf Report, which is um, a kind of nice graphical, so basically graphical user interface to um, just look at the data that was sampled, um, depending on on which options you used during. Um, during the record, you can also inspect the call graphs, order stuff, and go into annotation mode, so you can basically see um, where performance, where you could improve performance. We will let us see more examples about that. Um, there's basically perf script. Perf script without arguments just gives you a very easy to grab and maybe even shell, uh, shell process a way to look at the data. And, but it also allows you to, to implement small scripts with Perl and Python, which already, we will let see the data on, which already have the correct callbacks to um, the, or co the correct callbacks for, your, for all your events, and they already pass the, the uh, specific arguments they collect in the kernel by Perl or Python arguments. And there's Perf annotate. Perf annotate basically gives you an assembler view or a source code view with source code and assembly interleaved and annotates you which hotspots perf found in your in your code. Um, and we will see those tools later on a bit more closely. <coughs> so if we now try to play around with, with perf, um, there's a setting. So basically, perf depending on how which distribution you use. Um, you're not allowed to use Perth as normal normal user, but I tend to actually on my systems to to give full access to Perf by my users because I normally don't want to to um, always write sudo. So most of the time, I think it's perfectly okay if you are on a single single user system that you just enable Perf for normal users, and it makes some some stuff more more easy. <coughs> okay. Any questions or comments? <coughs> so there are basically four four areas. If we look at networking performance in the in the current kernel, um, we we tend to have algorithmic complexity, which is basically if we look at at how algorithms are are built. Um, so if we, for example, have what. Uh, Recent, recent optimizations in the FIP table by Alex, which did give a lot of gain in, in terms of performance. Um, there are also other things like like uh, how much code we actually traverse and where we can put put shortcuts. So, and where we have to do a lot of looping. Um, so those are basically things we can improve by by mostly looking at the code. And trying to come up with new with new um, algorithms, or I don't know, improve caching at some points, or install fast fast paths. Then a huge area which now nowadays comes up more often is memory access behavior. So uh, we have multiple CPUs fighting for the same memory locations all over, and um, trying to exploit parallelism, but actually not really exploiting it in a way that they contend often on specific memory, memory locations. And um, so that's basically a problem on scalability in the current kernel. So cross CPU memory access mostly stores multiple CPUs and causes uh, fault, sharing or fault sharing also slow store multiple CPUs at the same time. Then uh, we have it's also a bit like algorithmic complexity. We have assumptions on network traffic. So, for example, if you if you um, look at specific offloads we have in the kernel, like um, receive offloads, they they are only working if, for example, specific trains of packets are are uh, are received in in a short period of time, so they can get aggregated, and if a packet, for example, is missing from the train, then it gets received too late. 
the packets might already be flushed to to the upper kernel for processing, so it could not aggregate the kernels, and so we do multiple FIP lookups, we do multiple, we basically do everything multiple times for all those packets. And we will also see how Perf might be able to help us with reasoning about um, those assumptions. And I don't, don't know how the time is working out, so maybe we also can have a look at raw instruction throughput. Um, this is not, m not mostly about Perf, but there's also a tool called the Intel Architecture Analyzer out, where you can just throw some pieces of assembly code into it and it will simulate the pipeline of a uh, CPU. So, and you can check if maybe reordering specific lines or instructions can give you a higher throughput or better latency. <coughs> so, um, in the first field, algorithmic complexity, we, it's basically most easy to just really use something like perf-top and um, just try to, to sample cycles, in my opinion, to find the most used or heavyweight, heavyweighted users in the, in the system. Um, and for that, basically, um, uh, a new Cisco was implemented. So um, this is basically just looking a bit how, how perf event or how perf works and how this um, PMCs are programmed. Um, there is one Cisco which is perf event open. It has quite a lot of arguments, not that many, but um, it's a bit more complicated and I guess one of the longer main pages in the kernel manuals. Um, you, you can open it for specific kind of event, like for example for, for the hardware cycles, like we saw in the perf list command. And um, it can do, and it will return you a file descriptor, which, which you can uh, do two uh, kinds of things, like sampling or counting. So if you specify a sampling event, uh, you normally just memory map um, a ring buffer from the file descriptor and just process the ring buffer in case you do something like where you don't have to, where you don't want to, to sample stuff like just counting. Um, you can just use read and normally get long, long values from the file descriptor. Um, yeah, as I already explained, we have quite a lot of event types which are, um, which you can specify as um, events in perf event open. Um, we will look at a few of them later on. <coughs> so specifically for hardware events, you can look at perf list HW, which gives you the current um, list of, of uh, hardware events. <coughs> um, dash C and dash F, they, they allow you to override the frequency and or the, the, the sample period. And um, as I already said, that perf EV list dash V shows you the perf event or the attributes to the perf event more closely. Um, yeah, so I actually, at that point, I would like to have most of the people who want to participate in that maybe to try out some of the um, commands I showed so far, and maybe just trying to perf top dash e some specific um, commands from, from perf list, if you want to. Otherwise, I can just also go on and we can do that later on if you want. So. Either you just now try to play around with it a little bit for, I, I don't know, five minutes and just look at the counters your system provides and look at perf top or perf, um, perf top dash E, what you actually currently see on your system as, as most uh, showing up functions. Um, or I can just go on and finish the slides and later on in a closer group talk, do that. Okay. <coughs> um, okay, so who has, who tries to now get perf working? At, 
currently? Okay. Where where are you? What's your problem, or do, are you just currently installing it? Uh, you already got it working. Okay. Um. <clears throat> okay. So I guess the most hard, the, the um. The worst part is, part is mostly always to find a given workload or a benchmark which tries to actually show the performance problems. And, and luckily I cannot help you with that. So most of the people I guess use, just use NetPerf for that. Um, and so for example now if we, if we look at what PerfTop can do. So the basic, basic option is just PerfTop and it will show quite a lot of um, lines where you can browse into. There's also always a help with small h, with a letter small h, where you can do quite a lot of other things, but we don't need to do that right now. The, the interesting thing is basically how to deal with, with events. So um, PerfTop mostly allows you only to trace one event at one time. And um, we now want to focus a little bit on, on the hardware events. So hardware events also have some, some modifiers. And um, so basically, the, it's the same thing if you do just perf top or perf top dash e cycles. That will give you the same the same view. So the dash e cycles is the is the default. Um, but over time, it was noted by by AMD and and Intel. I guess at AMD first that because of the high um, the the length of the pipelines and when instructions get retired and and actually are dispatched. Uh, there's quite a huge latency between them, especially if you think about memory reads and memory writes. And also if you, for example, like, like uh, you have atomic operations and atomic operations just does not stall, but the later, the atomic operation, which is part of another code stream later on, uh, stalls because of your, mem or your memory barrier you did um, before that. Sorry, memory barrier is a fence, not memory barrier in the sense of a compiler barrier. Um, so they started to add specific, uh, a new subsystem to the CPUs, which uh, at AMD is called EBS, Instruction-Based Sampling, and PEPS at Intel. And what it allows you is that basically you can, in some sense, direct the CPU to try to get more, um, more accurate samples from the CPU. So you can basically, I will just quote what the um, sorry. <coughs> what the man page says, it's the man page of perf list. So you can specify multiple, you can specify the P modifier multiple times. And if you don't specify P at all, you basically say that the CPU can give you just any kind of um, location where the event fired. Um, if you specify p one time, it gives you constant skit. So basically, it, you always have some kind of, of constant offset from the actual location. And you can try on two, two level two, basically, on AMD and Intel system, where it tries to actually reduce the skit as much as possible and give you the instruction where actually the fault is. Um, so depending on your CPU, you can just try to put there as many p's as possible, so it, at some point it will just say that your uh, precise level is not supported by your current CPU and you have to remove a uh, piece until it's possible. So that's basically how you do it. <coughs> There's a modifier also for, for K, which, which says that you only want to um, enable kernel-only accounting, but it does not make a lot of sense for, for cycles because basically, um, yeah, you can just try to, to um, clean up your, your perf top display a little bit with it. <coughs> so, were there any problems or did people experience any problems who tried to do the perf top examples and got error messages? Not okay. Um, pardon? Was there a question? Oh. Yes. Uh, 
how d it's a s cycle and then a column PPP or what? <coughs> double colon cycles double colon. Double PPs. column and then PPP and yes, <coughs> and the number of P's specifies. <coughs> so double column and then the number of P's specifies the precise level the CPU should use for that specific. Um, Hardware trace, uh, hardware PMU, PMC. <coughs> and you can also try. So there's there are quite a lot of other different um, flags which you can use. So I mostly am interested in kernel performance. So I most of the time use the the K for kernel counting. But you can also try user space accounting if you are only interested in, in user space and user space events and um, also, specify specific flags that you only want to to have performance data out of virtual guests or in the hypervisor. So Perflis basically lists the ways you can you can use um, or what specific things you can you can trace. It's a there is not everything in the in in, in the man page, but most of the stuff is. <coughs> So what you can do with it is, f if you look at algorithmic complexity, if you hit a specific worst case workload, it should basically be pretty much at the top of perftop, and you can try to find ways to, to solve that. <coughs> and as I said, you can also try to sometimes try to int introduce caching and get around the algorithmic complexity in some places. <coughs> okay, let's look about reasoning about uh, at memory access behavior. So I, I took the examples from Eric Dumasset's um, patch, which actually I was I didn't know that actually it give gives such a big difference in performance, where he mostly just um, removed the read modify writes in the MLX4 code pass by using volatile reads and volatile writes to to the ring um, to the ring structures and. It reduced fault sharing quite a lot, so actually the code got more performant. And yeah, it's a little bit, I guess, of magic how to see stuff like that, but um, Perf also can try to, to pinpoint such locations, and there are also are new features in current CPUs which help with that. <coughs> so in that specific case, Compilers, especially GCC, which we currently use in the kernel, does do, they do not really help to to, for example, um, reason or they don't reason about memory loads and memory stores that much like maybe we would want to, and also they they currently have no model that they where they can reason about if they should, for example, issue prefetches to the memory automatically without the programmer knowing it. I guess. In kernel, we don't want that because also I heard that, for example, prefetch also always causes memory loads on some CPUs, so you cannot just use the compiler for that. So we need a, sometimes we need to do manual guidance. Um, so pacing memory access across functions. Um, so the cache lines are uh, loaded from memory or written to memory um, without stalls or avoiding read modify write instructions, where, for example, you can just use some local stack variable which has the same value as the in-memory variable which is shared, um, and use that for updating stuff. <coughs> so, um, okay, this is like basic knowledge. <laughs> um, in case you, you do performance analysis on the kernel, there's this rule that you basically should push Hot, hot elements of C structures to the front. So that basically the reason is that um, all CPUs only fetch complete CPU cache lines from the beginning to the end. And um, so basically, you want if you wanted to have the last value of a cache line, the CPU had to reload or had to load all memory from um, from the CPU, uh, from the memory, and then could just start the instruction again as in the moment the complete cache line was in the CPU. So nowadays more more uh, recent CPUs have something like early restart where 
in the moment where the memory really comes in, the instruction is restarted at that moment and not after the complete cache line is actually um, loaded into the CPU. Um, or even the new Intel Xeons, I don't know when it actually, when they actually did implement that, they implement something like critical word first. That's an extension where um, basically the, com the concrete memory location gets loaded into the CPU first and afterwards the complete cache line. So maybe in future we don't, especially on x86, maybe we don't need this rule anymore because the CPU will do it correctly for us. <coughs> yeah, so um, Perf has quite a lot of, of memory, uh, of cache, cache hit op uh, uh, traces or events we can monitor. Um, I don't actually have a, a scheme of what one one can do actually to to try to um, optimize such stuff. It's basically also about finding um, workloads and then playing around with with um, the specific events. I guess we I don't know. Um, there will be some exercises later on. <coughs> Uh, a new tool came in, so this is also re related to the PEPs, to the precise levels I explained earlier, which got introduced with PEPs and IBS. It's a perf mem, perf mem record, and perf mem re uh, record and report. And the interesting thing about it is that basically PEPs and IBS do not only give you more precise level, but they also provide you with the specific memory address which caused the hit or the, 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 uh, or the miss in the caches. So what PerfMem allows you is actually to see which memory location did um, hit or not hit the cache. And it's basically um, a wrapper about, around perf record. So most of these perf log or perf mem or perf kvm are commands are basically wrappers around record which just do some fancy stuff with the arguments. And in this case, they use the CPU mem loads with two precision levels. And um, there's an opposite command, which is perfmemtstore, which shows you the, the stores to the memory. And it's basically an alias for the CPU mem stores with double precision level. <coughs> um, I can show you something like that. So <coughs> I just use a small tool like stress, which now just has 10 instances with just malloc and free stuff. And we <coughs> just can run it for a small amount of time. <coughs> oh, it's, it's a bit. <coughs> so after we, I, I just press Control C, so um, uh, we now have a perf data file, and I can, by just running perf mem report, I just, the report tool just uh, opens the perf data file and displays the results. And that is basically what we get. So the interesting thing is that um, instead of using some other tool, we um, also have, have the data symbol with us. So we can now actually see at which memory, memory location um, the uh, hit or the miss um, was caused. So you can you can also like like with H you can sort in it and you can look it up. Um, the problem is basically that a lot of in a lot of moments you don't have any valid memory locations because of dynamic allocation of memory. So sometimes you can guess like for example if a pointer is in a specific slab location, you can guess by by looking at the at your slab store. Uh, in which region the pointers are, and maybe you can associate them back. Um, but I didn't have that good results with that actually. So um, yeah, so this is basically a feature which which also came in with the PEPs and IBS support. And since that was implemented, every every um, event has a specific additional data uh, associated with it, which basically says at that moment which memory, which memory address um, is causing the specific event. <coughs> so, um, yeah, so if you wonder about the CPU slash memload slash PP, 
um, event style. This is not documented in perf list. It basically is a pass, or you can interpret it as a pass in sysfs. So most of the most of the events are also duplicated in sysfs and sys devices CPU events, where you can find most of the um, events also, and you can specify them like like I you have seen here, just specifying CPU slash whatever whatever slash flags, and in some cases, like for example, if you want to see PCI Express performance on AMD systems, there's for example a specific non-CPU node for AMD North bridges where you can then specify sp specific event masks for the North bridge if you want to see how PCI Express data, for example, is moved around the bus. <coughs> Um, there are also some other cool tools, but this one is unluckily not available by default because you need to enable a lot of debug options like LockDap for that. But if you do that, it basi basically allows you to actually also look at contention problems in locks. So without, without um, perf lock, if you look at contention problems, you basically only see the raw spin lock functions showing up and you don't have any addresses where they are associate, associated with, and as soon as you have the perf lock command, I'm currently running a locked up enabled kernel, so I can show you now. Um, so if we know, for example, I don't know. I hope this generates some kind of pattern we can use. <coughs> We, we can yep. hardly see what you wrote there. Can you read it, like the command line you did? Ah, the command line before? Yes. Yes. It was basically this here. Just arbitrarily generating some SKBs in the stack. And now it generated a new perf data file, and I can now perf log report it. <coughs> so what we now have is basically a little bit too large. I guess if I pipe it into a less dash s, it might. Ah. Oops, sorry. Ah. So, but it, it helps you at least to, to somehow identify the specific logs. And um, so it gives you more of a better view of what contention is actually causing your system. You can also use perf script afterwards and debug the logs yourself, so you normally are able to actually identify the logs. And otherwise, you can also log, uh, just check it with proc logdap, where you can reread the specific kind of logs and also get the specific log class from. <coughs> Okay, so um, now this, those are basically all the all the trivial commands, and most of the time, you if you do perf list, um, you can either look it up or check what else. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So about log dep. Log dep is. Uh, quite expensive, so it's very disruptive. I usually use minus G so to, to get the core graph. <coughs> um, it basically works for every kind of event. <coughs> yep, and that's true. Usually by looking at the core graph, you can have a pretty good idea of where uh, the log contention, if any, happens. Yeah, that's also true. I just wanted to present the tool because it's also a special tool in, in the perf repository. Yeah, so um, Eric is correct. So basically, the call chain, which you can get with perf record dash small g, and also later on see in, in perf report when we do some more exercises, uh, allows you to pinpoint which specific log, not based on the, on the, co on the data or on the specific log location, but on the code pass, um, is causing the, the contention. <coughs> so um, Andy Clean, who is working for Intel, has a pretty 
amazing suite of, of wrappers for um, Perf, which is called PMU Utils. You can find it at GitHub. Um, I hope if you have internet, you can now git clone it because it also, I, I hope you have Intel CPUs. <laughs> Um, you can clone it, then we can have a look at the tools a little bit more, and you can maybe just play around with it or have a look at it. Um, so basically, it's on GitHub, PMU tools, where you can clone it, and um, I can show you some more things you can do with it. I will. I will also only show a small part of what is possible with PMU tools. They, he also has tools to actually do performance gathering on a uh, algorithmic way. So, if you, for example, have specific workloads and you want to analyze them more concretely, there are some wrappers around that. And we will also only look at at the CPU low-level features which those tools provide. Um, they don't add, add any any kernel code, but only um, basically wrappers and helpers for specifying CPU events, which otherwise you would normally specify as raw performance or raw counters or even in a more um, abstract way. <coughs> so I guess in, in, in case, I, I, I don't know anymore, if in case you have cloned the tree, there is a tool which is called OCPerf. And OCPath basically just invokes some other tools if it if you start it for the first time and it do it downloads um a mapping for specific CPU events to um raw uh, descriptions of, of raw counters which then can be fed into perf. And I guess it's somewhere in the home directory, I don't remember or it, um so you basically can also just uh, event download the file. And it will just download your specific JSON files, which represent the counters to your CPU. <coughs> and yeah, like it saves it like root dot cache PMU and events, and then you can look at it. So if you use OC perf list to look at all the to look at all the um, possible can, events, can you show the link sorry. again? Maybe we can download it now. Ah, sorry. <coughs> Is it okay now? I guess you just have to use it with a web browser and then there's a link to the Git repository. <coughs> uh, okay, thanks. Uh, so Git clone to that address just also works. <coughs> So if you use the OCPerf list event, it just gives you basically the output of your previous, what we had in, in perf list, so nothing new here. But at, but at the end, suddenly there are sh some new events are showing up. Dup, dup, dup. So you now have basically access to most of the internal um, PMC instructions you normally don't, don't see in perf list. And also, they are a bit more documented, so you actually can think or about what those specifically do. Um, so, if you if you want to look those up for AMD, there's um, it's actually quite easy. So you can also uh, just use. I don't have an AMD system with me right now, and you what you do basically is that you just use the AMD slash and underscore and B. Um, namespace and you specify the event and the um, mask from the manual and so you can do the same things you can do with the off-core events with proper, with proper and pretty, pretty names on AMD systems. Um, <coughs> so
so what you can, for example, see that, for example, if, if you look at a lot of um, memory specific issues, you can, you have the possibility to, um, you can, for example, specifically trace where your cache lines in layer two are switching from involved from from the specific MUSI states. I hope MUSI and uh, MUSI is is uh, known to the audience. So basically, in in the cache, there are always states associated with each cache line. On if the cache can be is is shared between different CPUs and can be read. Currently, if it's invalid, it must be refetched from from different memories. And um, if it's yeah, basically all the, all those states. If you don't know about it, just um, I guess it's pretty easy to just uh, still have it open. To, to look it up in, in Wikipedia. So there's MUSI and MUSI states. Different, uh, de uh, depends on the CPU you are using. And it just allows you to have a look at um, when specific code evicts specific um, data from the cache lines. So if you want to, you can now just play around with it. And maybe just if you have some user space programs, um, use uh, ocperf-e, you can always include as many events as you, not as many, but you can mostly in, uh, add multiple events at the same time. And so you can check where and when specific memory is uh, being evicted from the cache or is uh, requested for ownership. So basically all other memory is invalidated and your specific CPU wants to have um, full access to the cache line. <coughs> Sorry? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand you. The command line for, so I, I can show you just like, like how to do that. Um, so you use the ocperf command and you can just specify dash e record and then you can just pipe in <coughs> multiple events like that from from this um, specific um, <coughs> from the output sorry and then you can run your workload on it like um, And it will now measure the cache lines, uh, where the cache lines get faulted in and faulted out. And if you run the command, you can use any command or even a sleep with dash A for monitoring um, your kernel. And if you then <coughs> report the information, you basically have an overview of where your cache lines got into exclusive state or were invalidated for the duration of the command. <coughs> so I, I would like, I, I, th I think if you want to, to um, it's very interesting basically to look around what, what, com uh, what commands every CPU has and also to always check the CPU reference manuals, which well, a lot of those command, uh, a lot of those events are actually described in more detail. Um, always be also be aware of that that not all commands are supported by all CPUs. So sometimes you try to trace something and you think that you don't hit this the specific event, but maybe it's just not supported and you always get back a zero counter. <coughs> Most of those raw counters can also be, like I said, so basically you can always use the raw counters with, with everything else. That should also be no problem. So you don't need is to have this utility, but can also specify everything by perf. <coughs> okay, we are now leaving this hardware-specific 
uh, region a little bit and go into the assumptions on networking traffic, um, which deals a bit more with tracing and actually reasoning about logic in code. Um, like for example, we, we now have different assumptions where we can actually speed up network traffic in the kernel. One is XMIT more. So XMIT more allows to not do the MMIO barrier or MMIO write on all SKBs we transmit out of a specific interface, but we can now batch them and for example can send five packets at once without with only one time touching the um, expensive tail of a <coughs> the tail pointer. Um, during receive offload, we, we often see or we hopefully get paid, uh, packet trains which generate, uh, which result in aggregated S uh, SK, SK buffs. Um, and we sometimes also want to know, for example, if the aggregation is, is working and if it really does aggregate stuff. We can, for example, also monitor if root caches evict um, destination entries all the time and we try to, to re, um, reacquire them, or checking if flow sensitive, pack, uh, if the packet steering does not work correctly and we have cross CPU calls from, from some um, code. Um, and to do that, basically, we, we can specify probe events on our own. So what we now try to do is that, um, I have an example with XMIT more, so we try now to pinpoint if, if we currently really use XMIT more on delivery, on during the delivery of packets. And we can do that without any trace points, we just, or without any predefined trace points, so we only do specify um, uh, probes on our own and try to reason with the source code to now find a way to specify a, a node or a probe which gives us this information. <coughs> um, So hopefully, I guess the, if, if you don't have correctly working debug symbols, that's currently the moment where it will blow up. <coughs> so um, in the networking system, we have a few functions. So basically, the most important command you, you know will see is the pair of probe command, which, with which we actually modify and install probes and remove probes. And like the chaosum, uh, information, we, we have a perf probe dash um, big F, where we can see all function code, all the functions where we can now um, insert, or which we can reference with perf, and where we can try to look into and um, check if we somehow can install probes in it. So if you look, look around, basically we have quite a lot of, of functions. We also have most of the networking functions in there, so quite a, quite a lot, I guess. Uh, sorry. So you basically can, can set a lot of trace points already in the, in the code, in the kernel, without actually using anything predefined. Um, so in case, in case of, of uh, XMIT more, there's a problem that nowadays we tend to use a lot of static, in, uh, static inline functions, and those static inline functions are not representable as, as functions if you look at the binary, so because they get expanded in line in the source code. So there's often the problem basically that um, you need to dig down or you need to find actually a function which is not static or which is exported, not exported in the sense as export symbol, but only exported from the object file. So it does not get, modi uh, get, does not get um, optimized away. Yeah, sure. Um, I saw a couple of other profilers uh, managing to cope with the static inline and shows the uh, breakdown of the static inline function. And As you will see later on that perf can do that too. Ah, okay. <laughs> <coughs> so in case in case of in case of um, of this XMIT more flag, I, I decided to go with with uh, def XMIT function, so I can I can now try to 
perf probe dash f dash dash filter and just uses um, wildcard and we have quite a few functions which match that. So basically if you want to search for a function, it's basically the, the fastest way to to look around. I use it quite a lot if you, I want to just try to, to add filters and you can even use XArch and then install install quite a lot of a lot of probes at the same time for that. Um, you can you can use wildcards at a lot of situations. So even even if you want to, for example, perf, perf record something, you can always just always specify a star. And basically, you match all the props you already have installed. So with wildcards, you can quite easily get a very good overview of what is happening in your system. But we now try to get a bit more deeper. So um, we we now have found this. Dev XMIT function we want we want to use, and um, so now we we need to find out if we actually do get the do get so if the XMIT for, for uh, XMIT more flag gets actually set by the code. So what we do is we look at we look into the source code of Dev hard start XMIT. <coughs> we can do that by dash big L. <coughs> And what you now see is that basically a listing, listing of the source code and the lines which are numbered um, are uh, lines where you can install trace points. So it's now possible that, for example, you say, I, I, want, to, I want to install a trace point on a specific uh, line and then on that specific line, if, if code actually reaches a specific line, that trace point actually gets fired. <coughs> so what I did here was um, I decided for line number 17, I don't know if it's correct anymore, but I will just go on with it. Um, and there's another option which is called dash we, <coughs> where you can, at a specific location, ask perf to give you all the possible um, variables and symbols you want to trace. So what we now do is um, asking perf what variables are in your scope we can actually get into the perf prop so we can actually relay th all those those variables to user space and later on and later on um, check on the specific value um, and as you see if you look at to, into the xmit1 function um, we specify the boolean also so xmit1 the last argument basically is a boolean and if the boolean is um, is set then we basically Tell the driver that we will have a train of packets now going out of the uh, out of the driver. So what we want to do is basically check if the next pointer is null or is not null. So we need to specify a new probe. And um, do you see my mouse? Ah, okay. Basically, it's already here. So I'll show you a few more tricks what you can do at the same time. Um, can, I guess I cannot copy paste it in the <coughs> so I just have to type it by hand so I I define a new probe which is called DHSX just shorthand for dev hard start xmit if I wouldn't have specified anything it would just use the the function name as a probe name pardon oh um, sorry um, perf, if you look at the perf probe output sometime, you see that stuff gets optimized away and you sometimes have to pinpoint a little bit more because, uh, sorry? <coughs> Just enlarge the font. Or enlarge the font. That ah, sorry. See. Okay. Okay. Um, so you always have to have to check where next is actually set and sometimes because we we are now working on a on a um, on line information and line information is not always correct like for example if you there is no real comparison if next is zero un or not not equal but it will just pass a pointer down in xmit one which is, which is a static inline function I, I think yeah. what's not clear is that previously you said you want to see line 10 and then you run per probe big ah, okay. V. And you put specified Sorry. 17. That, that, that's what's confusing. So the reason is basically that at, I don't know, at the time I, I did this, I was not able to inspect the next pointer in at line 10. 
because basically x mid one is static inline function and it expands the um, the equality is is um, done later on in the in the um, static inline function. So uh, I just played around with it and tried the different um, locations or the different line numbers, and line 17 in the end looked looked like a good hit, and I also verified that with, with uh, the disassembly code. <coughs> so if I, I, I don't know if it works right now, so we can try to. We gen can just perf probe on line 10, and here you have the effect. So xmit1 is, is a static inline function, at, and it now shows you at which locations in the source code this function actually gets expanded. And the problem is basically that we have one, one at, at one point, um, this is this point. We actually have access to the next pointer, but if we would now insert um, a perf probe on line ten, we would have the problem that the expansion in, in at that region. So it, at uh, def hard start xmit plus byte offset tw seventy two um, would not give us access to the net to the um, to the next pointer. So in that case, I cannot literally install the um, probe in line 10 because it would fail because one of the locations where the function gets expanded is not able to, to fetch the next pointer. <coughs> so I could either go the route and install only um, the probe or install two probes at, at byte offset 79 and at byte offset 83, or I can just go with a, with a, um, with a probe below that. <coughs> So I use line 17. I now define a new an argument I want to extract from the kernel, which is the interface name. Um, I just it's just my 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 name, so you can write everything there, and only what is after the equal sign is responsible for fetching the name. So we have we see that at line 17. I, uh, sorry, I just this is the variables I have available. So what I can do now is I say that. I have this net device, and I want to see actually which on which net device the current logic happens. So I want to pretty print the name of the net device. So I can just use a def name and specify the type as string. So it will just give me a, a nice string um, for the specific line when it when the source code hits it. And at the same time, I want to extract the xmit more pointer, which I know where I currently just extract the next pointer, but in reality, basically, I want to have a Boolean indication if the specific pointer is uh, zero or not zero. <coughs> so we can then insert the, pro the probe, and perf now tells us that basically we can, just by running this, this command, we can now, sorry, we can now start with tracing. I don't know if it worked, but we can, so we, we have no samples, but we can now do some other commands like um, let it sleep for a little bit longer and hopefully in case we connect to the Google servers, we can at least get some visible effect of that. So let's see. Oh, sorry, uh, I just not, uh, I was thinking about GRO at the moment. Um, what would be a good example for that? So basically, it now tells me that xmit more is, is null, so we don't have a next pointer, and so xmit more is currently not in effect. Sorry, I don't can can up with a. I don't want to run out of time and don't want to set up netperf or something like that right now to to show you the effect. So in case, so in case. Um, we currently, it uses xmit more, I would have a, the address of an SKB um, being specified right there in the xmit more, and so I would see that basically I do now at the moment patch, um, patch packages. packages. <coughs> um, it would be, yeah, so, um, this gives a lot, a lot of options actually what you can do even without tracing, or uh, e sorry, even without statistics, or with um, different kinds of hard-coded um, trace points in the kernel, and you can have uh, quite a lot of, of um, yeah, insight 
to see a lot of inside gains in, in what the kernel currently does. <coughs> I actually now wanted to hope that people might be able to find a trace point or do that on their own so they can look into um, how many packets in GRO get aggregated just by writing a probe. Do people want that or should we do that afterwards if you come to me? <coughs> okay, no response. <coughs> Pardon? <coughs> so, uh, okay, first question, does, does everyone know what GRO actually is? <laughs> Sorry. So, um, Maybe you can show that if you want. Yeah, I will. <laughs> um, basically, GRO is is um, a way to aggregate packets in. So what what GRO basically does is during one NAPI call, <laughs> um, so it it tries to fetch multiple packets from the hardware uh, at the same time without any any um, risk scheduling. And if the packets match up, so for example, if you have two or three TCP packets and they match up in sequence numbers and in flags, and um, you just aggregate them to one TCP packet and send it up the kernel. So instead of actually processing three packets, three independent TCP packets, which would be much more intensive if you think about all the algorithmic complexity and stuff like that, it would just process one packet. Would, would do one routing lookup, would do one append to the socket queues and stuff like that, would only fetch or, or only lock, um, lock one pointer. Um, yeah, and basically the problem is that, that GRO is, uh, we kind of rely on GRO today for good performance in the kernel. So it's always best to actually have this aggregation in place. And <coughs> Yeah, so exactly we, we, what we now want to do is uh, trace when, um, or what we want to check when aggregation is actually happening or at which point we can um, use that. Okay, um, those who know actually what GRO is maybe can try themselves to now tr resolve this problem and otherwise I will um, now Help a little bit. <coughs> so basically, all the code you need is in netcore dev.c. That's basically where you need to look at. <coughs> So it's not that easy, and I currently don't remember the specific trace point myself, but it should not be too hard either. <coughs> Just could you repeat your question? What was your goal here? Because zero count here is not exactly what you. So I would for. like to to find a way to where we can actually trace. Um, how many packets, so how many TCP packets got aggregated into one into right. one SKB. So that would be the GSO SAGs you find in the SKB shared info. Because Jero count here counts the number of different flows active in the Jero engine. So that's mm -hmm. not exactly what you want. I currently also have to, to look around and don't know specifically where to place a probe. <coughs> But I guess this this location looks like something we could we could actually use. Do you agree, Eric? E Eric, I think he wants to that find a place where that. you flash yeah. it and. Pardon? Yeah, that would be that. <coughs> okay. Um, I just wait a few seconds, maybe until people can catch up. <coughs> if you want to try it yourself. <coughs> So the, the function is called NAPI GRO complete. 
in net slash core slash dev dot c. <coughs> So what what you normally do for the, if you want to try to find um, a way to or get an overview overview you just um, look at the lines in this function and with dash l like I showed before so you see there's at least some way where you have access to the SKB and um, you could somehow think about extracting this count. So for example, line nine accesses the NAPI GRO CB of the SKB and compares it with something, so it must be somewhere around in the memory. And we need now to get hold of that specific count and uh, trace it or uh, give it back up to user space. <coughs> so we can just look at uh, what we have available at line nine by using dash v, <coughs> and we actually see that the SKB is visible for us right there. So there's another problem now because, um, sorry, we do, we do this NAPI GROCB stuff. So NAPI GROCB has a problem that basically does, it's an unsafe, kind of unsafe cast, and we now need to specify memory offsets in perf. <coughs> and luckily, kprops allows us to do that. So we can specify, um, we can specify a, a fetch arc, so something where we fetch um, memory, or we, where we have a symbol available with an address which can be resolved by, by, um, by perf, and we can specify an offset to that. So it, it allows us to um, peek into the CB section of the SKB and extract the value. <coughs> um, so for that we need to add a new probe and NAPI geo complete. <coughs> and actually I, I again want to know on which interface this is happening, so I use SKB def name dot double colon string so I get a name where the SKB was, was arrived. And <coughs> now we need to look into how we can get access to the, um, to the specific offset. <coughs> so um, we know basically that we can just use the SKB as, as a base pointer. And we now just need to to look, sorry, to look into into the offset. And unluckily, I guess I want to know check if <coughs> we can now recalculate the offset. And for that, I will just re reuse um, sorry ah, von Larcher. I'm, I currently switched to the to the debug kernel of Fedora, so I re, re, uh, need to do, redo the calculation where the specific um, SK um, offset is. So we have this tool PH hole, and now I just need to extract my current VM Linux to do that. <coughs> So what this tool allows us to do is that we can, in some comfortable way, see s how C structures are laid out by the compiler. So I can call it on, on my VM Linux tool and uh, specify dash big C that I want to see the SKBuff structure. And now we see our big memory hook for which gets allocated for every package. And it's actually a pretty handy tool and I guess you should actually include it into your report repository of debug tools um, because it can show you where cache lines are, where you have still um, bits and bytes, where uh, where holes are in your structure, 
and also um, it can even automatically, I guess, dash big R, it allows you to even automatically reorganize your structures to remove the paddings. <coughs> but the problem basically is that uh, NAPI, so we can only find the CB in here, which is basically this part of memory, which starts at memory location 40 and uses 48 bytes. Um, So we now need to also look into um, uh, <coughs> uh, we now need to also find the offset in the NAPI GROCB. Um, I kind of think it's maybe easier to actually try to do that via GDB and just extract the, the location out of, um, out of the disassembly. So let's see. <coughs> So we have this compare with one and uh, RDE. I guess it might it might make sense if that's the look if that's the memory address of our SKB, um, and then it seems natural that OX3C is basically the offset to the SKB into the CB. So what we now can do is that we basically just specify the OX3C here, and that's our new trace point. Oh, sorry. Ah, yeah, sure, sorry. Uh, does anyone remember the type? It's U16, I guess. Pardon? Uh, I cannot do that because of NAPI GOCB. Um, I guess it's U16, I guess. I have it later on in my slides, I guess, somewhere. Yeah, it's U16. <coughs> Right, it's even at the same address. So I can just specify unsigned 16 here, and it will basically treat this value as an unsigned 16. You can do that for signed and unsigned six, uh, 8 until 64. And there's also some special cons constructs how you can specify um, bit masks. No. Okay, we still have, I still have a problem. U64 doesn't have us. Okay, let me just check what I... I don't know why I specify U16 and it says that U64. Pardon? That's true, yes. No, it's also... I'm not sure why this is happening right now. Oh, there seems to be a parse error somewhere. I can just remove that one. No, that's not. That's that one. Okay, that's... Still not have it working. So perf dash d probe wildcard does remove all probes from your current kernel. <coughs> I have no idea what is happening right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, RDI was wrong. I would have to use DI because I were I'm not allowed to use the the um, R specifier, the length. So it did work with percent DI. Um, so now we can try to do that to use a probe. 
and I now just try to contact Google servers and send a whatever, and it hopefully tells me that I have some kind, no, it did not aggregate. Hopefully that does work some, at some point. <coughs> Sorry? <laughs> no, I want to be that. <coughs> mm, what else can I do? Yeah, I can do so. Ah, that's loopback, that does, yeah. So I need to find a big image. I <laughs> I can, yeah, I should, can do that. Oh, I guess I don't have any internet anymore, so that's a problem. Or do I? I just keep it running. does still work, so I try to. <coughs> yeah, I got aggregation. <laughs> okay, so um, as I showed you, if you use a dash v, you actually do see where inline functions also get expanded, but there are sometimes Sometimes you really hit problems where it's really hard to find the assembly, especially currently perf annotate does not allow you to speci to, to um, if you have huge amounts of static inline code into static inline code, it really makes it hard to follow that even in GDB, and sometimes GDB just stops to expand uh, uh, static inline functions at some point, I guess the level is eight. And after that, you're a bit screwed, and the chance that you can actually inline, uh, that you can actually specify probes on, on such code is, is not that good. So it sometimes actually makes sense to, to, modify, to modify your kernel code to, we have this no inline defined in the kernel, which expands into this attribute for no inlining, um, which then basically allows you to specify a probe point directly on this, on this function. Are you actually, it's very often that you actually have to move code around, so from the header file into an object file and then update, uh, add a prototype for that and maybe even export symbol that function, but if you really want to trace it and make it your life much a bit easier, you can do it like that. Um, for if sometimes stuff really gets very, very uh, strange, you can also add your own volatile variables and just ex uh, um, extract some data into this variable and then use it with perf to... Excuse to me? Yeah, sorry. Next question. But even if I remove the static inline from some of my function, uh, sometimes the compiler can uh, inline it anyway. So, so that's the reason why you can specify no inline. And no inline really will force the compiler to not inline the code. But it has a semantically different behavior. So if you look, for example, at the GCC manual, there are different kind of how static inlining works and when static inline does not become static inline. So for example, if you have a static inline function, but you also have a function pointer taken from the static inline function, it will generate a locally static inline function which is not inline anymore in the specific object file, even though it was only included by the header. So you see the problem? So you suddenly yeah. start to have m multiple same named only local static inline functions and multiple object files, which then get, get linked together. Yeah, I understand. But sometimes it's, <coughs> it's hard with the kernel. We tried uh, uh, not long, long, not long uh, time ago to uh, compile the kernel with, uh, without optimization. And, it, and apparently it, uh, uh, without can, optimization, it cannot be made. I don't think that works, actually. Yeah, it doesn't work, yeah. Yeah, because, because the build back on macros, actually, they, yeah. they depend on the removal of the function calls, and if you leave it them in there, you, you actually have undefined, not resolvable linker errors. Yeah, yeah, but um, I just wanted to say, I, I said it before, maybe we can uh, look at it uh, sometimes, that 
I, see, I did see some other profilers like O Profile and uh, Vtune. Yeah. I actually uh, have to say that basically I don't use it anymore. So I actually kind of always find the correct pro point. And even though I, I, I uh, um, do have inlining effects a lot, and current disassembly disassemblers are pretty bad, I think. So maybe you guys can tell me if you saw some other disassembly tool which you use. I basically use GDB with Emacs. Um, or sometimes on systems where I don't have the setup, I just object dump the whole VM Linux binary into one large file and wrap around. That takes quite a while. <laughs> Basically, the problem is that you sometimes you need the disassembly to source code equivalency, and that's sometimes really hard to get if you have a lot of static inline functions. So, and that's not a, not, not a problem of the tool of perf per se, but it's a tool is a problem of you trying to understand the code. <coughs> yeah. So basically, what you also can do is is uh, is using um, volatile variables to extract stuff and then just poke on the stack. There's a lot more in, in, in uh, what you can actually actually uh, use or capture. Um, there's also the perf I can show you. Um, perf probe dash f dash dash x turns, which also shows you all the, the public visible symbols at that point. Or I can do that with dash y def hard start x mid. Oh, sorry. So it also gives you um, the information about all the um, visible, globally visible symbols at that moment, which you can also use in your in your pro points. Um, Yeah, basically you can you can try or actually try to get every everything out of the stack. Sometimes you need a bit more more brain power to do that. Like for example, if you want to extract IPv6 addresses, you have to use multiple um, U64 um, arguments to do that, and then reassemble that in code. Some question: yep. uh, What happens if you dereference a null pointer? Have you tried that? Like SKB dev name, what if we we can try to do so? I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, in this case the SKB dev will be multiple prop kernel read, so it doesn't care. So it will. Just I, I guess so. Yeah, I, I, I remember. I'm not sure it anymore, but it uses some safe read memory function which checks which it checks goes, for a lot go, of it go, it goes eventualities. The prop, prop, prop kernel read that it will yeah. just like it, it disables the faulting. Uh, yeah. Just so, so what we can <coughs> we can try it like I have this xmit more thing still around here, and we can now just uh, it's an SKB, so we just dereference the def, and I give it another name, S so it will perf record. <coughs> Should already work. Yeah, so it just gives me a null pointer, Eric. Even if I have a dereference. <coughs> um, okay, any questions so far? <coughs> uh, so what what else is interesting is that, for example, you also can do that with return values. So often return values are not uh, that easy to trace, so there are some special syntax to do that. Um, in case of this dev hard start xmit, you can specify a percent return on the function name, and the return value is in the dollar red val variable. <coughs> Question? Yeah. Uh, so the one th one thing I know don't fully understand yet is there was a, a method to modify an offset. When would you actually use that? Since it didn't work for the SKB to uh, GSO sex um, pointer. Why? 
When, when can you actually use it? When, when is, is there cases where you don't have to use the actual register value or the, the actual register name? Actually, I'm not sure why. I will have a look at it. So it showed to me that basically at that point I have the SKB available. Um, actually, currently there are quite some bugs in the code which are, be, are already fixed upstream. But for example, this return and red world thing I can also not show right now because there's a bug in it and it already doesn't, does not correctly register the pro point. But uh, in older or better, uh, so in other kernels it currently works, but my kernel is currently not able to do that. So it might be a bug, I don't know. So it also, there's also differences in, in perf does have two elf backends. So you sometimes also get different results if you use elf utils or the lib elf stuff. So it's, you always have to double verify if everything really is as, is as expected. Um, just uh, so if, you are, if your debug info sometimes is, is messed up, so for modules you sometimes have to, to actually dash M and specify the debug information for the module. If you, for example, now start to trace in IEEE as in the wireless stack, this is just an example. Just You just have to specify where the extracted debug information are for uh, the specific module. Normally it should work without doing that. And the cool thing is that basically works everywhere, not in the kernel, so you can use this dash X and you can look into user space too. So all commands I just showed you are also available for user space. You just have to specify either the shared object and also you need to have the um, debug information available for them. And then you can do the same thing in user space, basically everywhere, which is kind of cool. Um, okay, I not, not, so basically if there are, as I showed before, but I don't think I do any more examples on that. Um, so, ooh. So, um, you can also specify raw events, so you can easily, I, I don't have any good examples for that right now because OCPF mostly covers all cases for, for Intel CPUs and AMD CPUs are, are also specified pretty easily just looking up the tables and the manuals and using this AMD underscore NB, NB for Northbridge and using specifying the event and the mask value and the flags like PP kernel only. St only. Um, you can do some other pretty cool stuff. Like for example, if you are in GDB, you can, you can extract the address of the, the memory location of a specific um, date, data, and put a breakpoint on it and trace a breakpoint. So that's for example, in this case, we, we extract the FIP6 serial number and every time the serial number is getting updated, we know that basically we have a full caching validation going on in the current IPv6 stack. And we can, for example, um, trace that with that command. That's also pretty handy. Okay, I, I can't, uh, maybe if people come to me, I can show you how you can work with perfscript. So basically perfscript also has some pretty nice scripts people normally don't know. Um, there's, for example, this uh, something, um, some predefined scripts which are, which are sent out with the perf distribution. Um, interesting for, for kernel or for networking people is mostly the net drop monitor because perf is, I, I, I learned that perf is probably more often installed on systems than Dropwatch. So you can also use the net drop monitor like perf script net drop monitor to extract the same information. Um, there are quite a lot of other cool scripts I would like you to play around with, like NetDev Times, which basically places a probe on the NetRx action and the return of the NetRx action, and it kind of gives you, it's not very granular, but it shows basically where most of your time is spent during the execution of the soft IRQ. Um, yeah, just play with them and also look into the comments of the scripts at the top. Basically, they give you much more details uh, what they do. <coughs> um, 
Okay, I will skip this section now because I only have uh, three minutes left. Um, do you have any questions? Okay. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, that's it.